Brian Guy, and I am a professor of communication studies and the director of the Investor Junior College speech and debate team. Over the next hour and a few minutes, we have a really fantastic show put together for you as members of MJC's speech and debate team show you some of what they've been working on so far this season. I just have a couple of quick announcements and then I'll give you a little bit of a preview of what the show is going to be about. So first off, my guess is that there are a slew of folks, especially my students, that are out here as part of a class requirement. If that's the case, you should follow the directions given to you by your professor as to how they want you to improve your attendance at the event. However, many students, including those of you who are in my classes, I've asked you to fill out one of these critique forms. If you didn't get one of these, they have a bunch of them in the front of the, uh, the house. However, on the critique form, there is two sides. There's a front side that deals with the speeches, which is the first half of the show. And then on the back side, there's some information about the debate, which will be the second half of the show. The second announcement that I have for you all is I'm guessing many of us have a device like this in our pockets. My request to you all, out of respect for our performers, you wouldn't mind silencing the phones so that we don't have any phones going off during the presentations. And as much as possible, if folks can keep phones put away so that they're not a distraction to the individuals that are here to inform and entertain you, the members of the speech and debate team, we greatly appreciate that, uh, that act of respect. Well, folks, we have an exciting show for you tonight. Over the next hour, you're going to have the opportunity to see several award-winning and presentations that have been given by members of the MJC Speech and Debate Team, as well as an exciting debate. The individuals that are here presenting to you tonight are just the first in a long line of MJC students that have taken up the mantle of intercollegiate forensics. In fact, the MJC Speech and Debate Team has been in existence for coming up on 100 years. Yes, when the MJC celebrates its centennial in just a couple of years, one year after that, our MJC Speech and Debate Team will also celebrate their centennial, which means for the last 100 years, members of the Modesto Junior College student community have practiced various forms of intercollegiate speech and debate and have used those skills to travel to tournaments all over California and the country. The individuals that are going to be presented to you here tonight are doing very much the same thing. In fact, we just got back from our first tournament last, uh, last week in San Francisco, where we brought a whole slew of awards home and had a variety of uh, successes. So, as you watch the performance tonight, if this seems like it's something up your alley, one of the cool things about Speech Night is many of the individuals that are going to be presenting to you all tonight are folks that discovered intercollegiate speech and debate by watching this very performance. And so, at the end of the evening, if this is something that you think that you might be interested in, I encourage you to come talk to me, come talk to one of our coaches, or any of the members of the Speech and Debate team, and we'd be glad to give you more information about how to join our team, because we are always looking for the next generation of talent. Well, with that, folks, you've heard enough from me. I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to my co-director of forensics, Professor Tori Shipp, to introduce you all to the 2019-2020 MJC Speech and Debate team. Have a great show. first event, you will see an informative speech. So this type of speech introduces cutting edge topics and seeks to help the audience understand them fully, using substantial explanations, factual and, and factual information. The goal is not to sway the audience's opinion. The goal is to share with them a wealth of knowledge regarding innovations and discoveries that are happening today. 
The informative speaker you will hear from tonight is Iman Ghey. Iman double majors in international relations and economics. This is her first semester on the team, and she has been practicing Muay Thai, traditional Thai kickboxing, for almost four years. And so, if you try to follow her in the parking lot, she will kick you in the head. Please welcome Iman Ghey. market 
by the year 2030. Now that we've seen how promising GAP is, let's look a little bit at how it works. The idea behind it is pretty grand, but the execution is pretty simple. Decarbonize the global economy by extracting CO2 straight from the air through a use of some giant fan and a chemical filter. Then we use that extracted material to turn that fuel into things that the Earth could use for energy stuff, among other things, you know. And we could clearly see that through Carbon Engineering's website that their system integrates two main processes. The first process is able to pull CO2 through a device called an air contractor. The CO2 is pulled and mixed in with a hydrogen oxide solution. And then it's able to convert the CO2 into a stable liquid solution that's then easier to transport. The second process regenerates the capture of liquid from that air contractor and delivers pure CO2 as the end product. Akshat Rocky writes reports in July of 2019 that the pure carbon solution is then transported to a container where it's brought into contact with calcium oxide that reacts with CO2 to form calcium carbonate. Bear with me, it's a lot of science. It goes through a third container where the calcium carbonate is then heated to 100 degrees Celsius to again create calcium oxide. While the plant is in operation, these two systems work in tandem and it's able to continuously produce sequestered CO2 as the output and only requiring energy, water, and just a small amount of chemicals as its input. The sequestered CO2 can then be reused to make fuels and other useful energy products. Alternatively, it can be injected underground for long-term removal or to revitalize the depleted gas and oil fields that we see degenerating today. Now that we looked at how DAP could change the power of our environments and the future, let's look a little bit on its implications. The wide-scale implementation of DAP prevents some amazing opportunities, and also it shows some amazing choices. I mean, in February 2019, an article from the Peer Reviewed Journal, um, Global Change and Adaptation, conducted analysis of carbon engineering's plans to implement DAP commercially. Their findings show that DAC systems appear to be the most feasible mitigation strategy for achieving the targets set out by the Paris Climate Accords in 2015. Pursuing this technology is the way for the United States to show its commitment to our global communities. And a June 2018 peer-reviewed article in the Journal of Sustainable Energy and Fuels Against DAC says that it's the missing link needed to finally stop and close that carbon cycle as it would allow us to effectively reduce the carbon while simultaneously producing fuels that can be used in existing vehicles and other energy needing products. However, this also leads us to some difficult choices. At its core, DAC gives us the technology to reduce the amount of carbon our planet um, needs in the atmosphere. For the first time, since our ancestors started cracking open the atmosphere and releasing those fossil fuels, it, this technology now exists to put these materials back where they belong, safely stored, underground. The problem though lies in economic motivation, and what excite, excites investors is that they can, they can use new oils and create new plastics without the needs for any costly extraction. And it's important to note that these materials will also be carbon neutral. And in other words, it would not require any additional carbon to produce them. However, instead of re reducing our carbon levels, it actually just reuses it. The plastic would still contribute to overflowing landfills, and the oil will just crowd our cars with roads, but corporations are still capitalizing on it. In August 2019, um, it was reported that both ExxonMobil and Chevron have recently invested millions of dollars into this technology, and they hope it will allow them to reduce their carbon outputs while extracting the same amount of oil in the end. On one hand, the economic viability of DAP means it's more likely to get a buy-in from very powerful players. On the other hand, valuing economic stability over environmental sustainability is the difference between fixing a problem and just prolonging the onset of that problem. That being said, the previously cited source from the Rodium Group in 2019 said that this specific application 
for like fuels and oil and sequestration matters really little if they just want to reach their 20, 30 deployment goals. And in other words, the progress is still progress and DAP is our way forward. So today we looked at what direct air capture is, how it's promising and how it's a new technology that's gonna change our world for the better. We looked at what it is, how it works, and it's some more complex implications to our society today. Our generation is saddled with a carbon debt, a debt that has been accumulated from our grandparents and parents and the ancestors that came before them. And it's still realistic to actually do something about climate change, address it the way it's supposed to. And direct air capture gives us a choice. We can either use this debt tech now to pay back that debt, or we can just pass it on to our children in the future. Thank you, Imam, for that fantastic speech. So, in our next speech, our second speech, you will hear what is a persuasive speech. So, this is going to be a presentation that seeks to identify and describe an ongoing problem, something that's going on currently in the status quo. The speaker will be using emotion, logic, and credibility and urge to attempt the audience to act on this controversial issue. Tonight, our persuasive speaker is Alexis Girardo. Alexis double majors in economics and public administrations. This is her third semester on the team, and she is a level 76 warlock with crafting level 93 in Skyrim. Yeah, yeah. Now please welcome on this magical gangster to the stage. However, 
As a result of the Trump administration metering applications, many applicants are forced to wait in Tijuana for months. This is very dangerous for applicants. Late last year, during their wait, three migrant children were killed. Now, according to 2019 CNN, as a result of the dangerous conditions in northern Mexico, many of these children who would be legal asylum seekers choose to find safety through entering the U.S. illegally. Once they do, they lose all legal protections and are at the mercy of U.S. courts. This brings us to internal factors. Since Donald Trump took office, his administration has sought to significantly decrease both legal and illegal immigration into the U.S. This effort has taken form in the policy that allows the separation of families in an increasingly merciless, complicated legal process. New York Times 2019 explains that this administration has forcibly separated 3,000 children from their parents. However, the article goes on to say that because of shoddy record keeping, that number is likely grossly understated with the real numbers being impossible to know. Now that we understand some of the causes of this crisis, we must examine the effects to see the true toll this takes on children once they enter immigration court proceedings. Now, as you might guess, the outcomes for these children are rarely favorable. Children in migration court face both physical and psychological trauma. First migrant children that wind up in U.S. custody are often having a history based of psychological trauma. According to the APA Association of 2018, these children commonly suffer the effects of post-traumatic stress disorder. And this is further compounded by the conditions they face in U.S. custody when they are forced to live with the fear that they may be sent back to the violence they just escaped. Additionally, the state reported in 2019 that migrant children had been sexually assaulted and mistreated by border officials. According to the previously cited article, a majority of children receive no legal counsel during their stay. Some immigration judges see no problem in this. According to the Washington Post 2016, longtime judge Jack H. Weil insisted that three and four year olds could be taught enough immigration law to defend themselves in court. Not only is this ridiculous, but this is simply not true. According to data from Syracuse University's Track Immigration Database reveals that when a child has legal representation, 82% of them are granted legal status. However, when a child does not have legal representation, 80% of them are deported. Children who are deported face an incredibly cruel reality upon their return home. First, as a result of the agreements between Mexico and the Trump administration, Mexico has agreed to immediately deport many of these children back to Central America. According to PBS 2019, children returning back to Central America face a wide variety of deplorable conditions, which can include unbearable debt, stigma, alienation, and violence. Many gangs in countries such as El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras target many of the children returning from the U.S. in hopes that they have brought money back with them. UNICEF 2018 reports that the majority of these children that are targeted are murdered when they are unable to pay those gangs. U.S. policies have exacerbated an already difficult issue and has created a humanitarian crisis with a body count that rises every day. In order to solve this crisis, it is imperative we take a multi-pronged approach. There is legislation that could pass today that would greatly check back against these injustices. However, we also need long-term reform to U.S. immigration practices and procedures. First, let's look to some quick fixes. There have been two bills introduced into the current Congress that if passed would help guarantee protections for migrant children. First is S662, Fair Day in Court for Kids Act of 2019, and this bill would guarantee access to a lawyer for all children facing deportation. Next is H.R. 3775, Equal Justice for Immigrants Act of 2019, which would ensure legal representation for all vulnerable populations, including those under the age of 21. Once passed, this would amend the Immigration and Nationality Act to provide resources to children and families who have been separated from one another. Now, the most effective way for these bills to become a law is for us to pressure our elected representatives. According to the New Yorker, 2017, short of showing up in person, 
The best way to sway your congressperson is through a phone call to their office. On the following handout, I have provided a sample script and a website where you can easily find your congressperson's phone number. I implore you to take two minutes out of your day to call, and if you would like a handout, it will be placed in the back of the room. In addition, you can also volunteer with or donate to some of the nonprofit organizations <laughs> who currently strive to provide legal representation for minors in court. You should also consider helping organizations in rural, less populated areas, because oftentimes these are the least funded or carry the heaviest burden. It is clear that the best way forward is to grant legal representation for minors in immigration court. So today, we looked at the causes and effects and solutions to America's child migration crisis. Sophia Gonzalez, a child of only four years old, was forced to represent herself without an attorney and was subsequently deported back to her home country in El Salvador where her fate is unknown. Sophia's story is heartbreaking and joins those of thousands of other children who share a similar fate. I beg you, we have to do better. It's magical. Thank you, Alexis. <laughs> so, for our third event tonight, we are going to have a prose a prose piece that will be performed. In this presentation, the speaker performs a piece of published literature. The performer seeks to move the audience and to make a point by embodying these characters and inviting the viewers to become more immersed in the act of storytelling. The performer you will see tonight is Alex Ciprian. Alex is double majoring in communications and liberal studies. This is her first semester on the team, and she is a brown belt in judo and is also heavily involved in Mecha, a student group on campus. So please join us in welcoming Alex. Identity. 
You would take the roll of film home and develop it yourself in a secret back room, at the, a dark room at the back of your closet, which is a secret dark room. The photographs were of documents in tiny print that you had to study with a magnifying glass and then promptly burn them flush. This particular memo was quite disturbing because it told us to watch our thoughts, to watch our paranoia. What had just happened was that an elder resistance member had turned himself in to the secret police. He was walking around downtown Santiago with a briefcase full of top secret documents containing meeting points, contacts, addresses, tactics, strategies, and he was convinced that he was being followed and that an ambush was imminent. He turned himself in to the militarized police, briefcase and all. The sad part was that he was not being followed but 17 years in the underground, plus the disappearance of his children, had finally broken him. He had given himself away, and so many others whose details were in that briefcase. I thought back to a few years earlier when I got my first paycheck teaching English as a foreign language, which was also my facade. If you could finally eat something other than crackers and cheese. My husband and I filled our shopping carts to the brim with all kinds of delicacies. Dulce de leche, rose hip jam, cans of tomato sauce, packages of spaghetti, blocks of cheese. I was reading the ingredients on a package of breaded soya cutlets when my eyes met the steady gaze of a man in a beige polyester pinstripe suit hanging on to an empty shopping cart halfway down the aisle. He half smiled at me. My knees buckled. Every hair on my body stood on end. I was numb with fear. He was one of them. He was one of the dreaded secret police. How did I know this? Good instinct. I just knew. I whispered to my husband, and we continued slowly working our way up and down the aisles working our way up and down, acting normal, filling our shopping carts, as we've been trained to do over a two-year-long training period, the man following, always keeping a half mile between us, our minds scrambled. It was noon on a Saturday, and the supermarket was packed. We looked outside, and amongst the pedestrians in the traffic, we saw an idling Piaget 504 at the entrance with three men inside of it. There were two antennae, one in the front and one in the back your police car. This is it. We were screwed. But on our way into the supermarket, we had surveyed our surroundings as for our training, and we noticed that right next door there was a telephone company with mirrored windows, the kind where you can look out, but people cannot look in. We slowly made our way into the shopping checkout counters. The man lined up just down the way. We loaded our groceries, and when it was our turn to pay, we slipped out quickly instead and lost ourselves in the crowd at the entrance and ducked right into the telephone company. A moment later, the man came running out, reaching into his jacket pocket for his gun. He ended up diving into the waiting car, and they took off, like, took off at lightning speed as we watched from inside. I was hollow with fear. We spent the rest of the afternoon zigzagging through the city, trying to lose the possible tale. In 1990, the dictatorship ended. Though Pinochet's global economy remains intact in Chile, we saw this as a huge loss. The resistance expanded. I ended up getting divorced and moving back to Canada. But the question always remained. What had I imagined it was real? 25 years later, I was writing a memoir about these experiences, so I went back to Buenos Aires to ask my husband a few questions. We met at a restaurant, and I asked him if he remembered the supermarket incident. He didn't. My heart sank. Had I invented the scenario, and so many others like it? Was I just like the man with the briefcase? I went into great detail about the supermarket, and he said he had no idea what I was talking about. I was confused. He remembered everything else, everything that we had done, just no incident of ever being followed. I was ashamed. A few days later, I saw a photograph in the newspaper 
It was a picture of the man from the supermarket. 25 years had passed, but I knew it was him. I read the story. The man in the photograph was a Chilean secret police operative operating in Argentina in the 70s and 80s. He had just been stabbed to death by his 21-year-old lover. When the Argentinian police went into his apartment, they found a stack of boxes at the back of his closet. Inside these boxes were files with all the details of the activities, including names of Chilean resist resistance members that he had followed, tortured, and murdered. Still, how could I be sure that this was the man from the supermarket? How could I recognize a face a quarter of a century later? A few months later, a fellow Chilean resistance member sent me an email with the subject title, This Will Interest You. Somebody had taken it upon themselves to transcribe the files, and now the document was being sent to us to those of us who had lived in Argentina in the 70s and 80s. I poured through this document, which was literally hundreds of pages long. I finally came upon a short paragraph describing a following in a 1986 incident in a supermarket in the city that we had lived in. It described a young couple in their late teens. It was a young couple. The girl was a Chilean exile raised in Canada, back in Argentina to join the resistance. The trail had been lost that day. The paragraph said what the intention had been. To pick up this couple, throw them in the back of a car, torture them, then murder them and dispose of their bodies. I read this paragraph with my hand over my mouth, horror seizing me, but also a sense of relief. Relief that I was not crazy, that I could trust my instinct, my memory, my life. Many of my fellow resistance members have died young from all the stress, all the terror, the paranoia, and from not having the answers to so many questions. And one of the things that has helped save me is the gift of being able to witness the evidence of my own experience, to reclaim it, to own it, to speak it. Thank you so much, Alex. So, now we are finally coming to our final event, the debate. So, in this formal style of debate, teams are randomly assigned to argue opposing sides of a controversial issue. The team who prepares the best arguments for their side will be declared the winner. Audience participation is welcomed and encouraged. If you hear an argument that you like or you agree with, go ahead and you can actually knock on your guys' armrests on the side. You can say, here, here. You can stomp your feet. Either way, all three of those are acceptable to be showing your support for whoever is up on the podium debating. So in this debate, you will hear from an affirmative speaker and a negative speaker. Now let's welcome back to the stage Iman and Alex. So Iman can read three books a day if given rain, and Alex, despite being young, has a vast knowledge of music. Woo! I call the house to order. As a reminder to the audience, debate is an interactive activity, and please knock, clap, or stomp your feet or say here, here, later, making a good point. I now recognize the affirmative speaker to deliver a constructive speech not to exceed six minutes.
and last tournament, we did so well together that we just had to go against each other. So, <laughs> allies, enemies, per se. So, <laughs> so with this, I'm just gonna go into my constructive and I'm gonna start my time now. All right, so let's begin this debate with some resolutional analysis. We're gonna ask you to weigh this debate on the framework and criteria of net benefits. If I can convince you that the good that comes from banning fracking outweighs the costs, then you should declare me the winner of this debate. And if my opponent can prove that the good does not outweigh the costs, or we in fact make the world worse off overall in the end, then you should consider them the winner. With this, I'm gonna go into some background points. Hydrofracking is an oil and gas extraction technique developed in the late 40s. It, to gain access to fossil energy deposits previously inaccessible, inaccessible to, dr to drilling operations. The process hydraulic fracturing literally involves the smashing of rock with millions of gallons of water, along with sand and an unknown amount of chemicals in order to bring gas to the surface. So in 2000, there was about 276,000 natural gas wells in the United States, but by 2010, that number had almost doubled to 510,000, according to the United States Department of Energy. And every year, about 13,000 new wells are drilled. And according to a 2014 study, at least 15.3 million Americans have lived within a mile of a fracking well that has been drilled into since the 2000s. Natural gas has been toted as a bridge fuel, and the climate-friendly alternative that will fuel society into green energy is able to come up to scale. And then faucets started catching fire in Pennsylvania. And then earthquakes started happening and shaking Oklahoma City. And evidence started accumulating that in, this indicates that gas itself is actually hurting our climate and our people. So with that, I'm actually gonna go into um, my plan text. The plan here is that the United States Congress will pass a law that prohibits the use of hydro, hydraulic fracturing to extract oil and natural gas. Some solvency points here is this plan will go into effect as soon as possible and will be enforced by the Department of Energy. Any funding necessary would be tied with enforcement and will happen through any normal means. So I'm gonna go into my advantage one, which is global warming. My argument here is that fracking keeps us dependent on fossil fuels and undermines decarbonization. And despite the idealistic promises of, fossil, of the fossil fuel industry, fracking does exceed the threshold where it would actually contribute less to greenhouse gas emissions than coal or any other energy substitutes. When it comes to limiting climate change, the key factor here is time. Okay? Carbon dioxide from burning anything could just linger for centuries, and it's imperative to ramp down on any kind of greenhouse gas. And there's always, if we're gonna build up new, new plants, there's gonna be a decade or decades long commitment to actually make these things committed to producing the type of energy we needed. So we're actually increasing these, the long run of how we're supposed to use them and when we're supposed to use them. If our plan passes, then a widespread national ban on fracking is then implemented. One of the main chemicals released in fracking is methane. And it is estimated that 4% of it escapes into the atmosphere during extraction because methane is 25 times stronger than carbon dioxide in terms of trapping heat. The release of this gas is detrimental to all types of air quality and in surrounding fracking sites. So with the affirmative plan, we will continue to directly, without, I'm sorry, without the affirmative plan, we will continue to directly increase air pollution at these well sites. And we're looking at pollutants increasing the production of long-term lingering smog and other detrimental effects. The impact of this is air pollution, obviously, which destabilizes the Earth's equilibrium temperature. This warming will obviously and most probably lead to extreme weather events like we've seen with hurricanes, mass fires, rising sea levels. And mind you, it's seemingly obvious who this is going to affect the poorer parts of the world, far more than, than any kind of rich communities. The poor is going to suffer because all these fracking sites are at least within a one mile radius within these people. This is actually gonna lead me into my second advantage to this plan, which is water pollution. Fracking 
requires a massive volume of water. Wells can release toxic chemicals like benzene into the air. Fracking sites can experience explosions and fires. They can contamin contaminate our drinking water. More than 17 million people in the United States alone live within a mile of active fracking wells. And research shows that fracking can lead to all sorts of detrimental health effects. This plan passes, and there will be a significant decrease in water pollution. And without this plan, groundwater stays contaminated because just as pockets of oil and gas are released by fracking, so are pockets of fresh water, which means they're undrinkable and uns unsalvageable. And the, and the impacts, obviously, are going to be, we're going to prevent illnesses, and we're going to disport this, we're going to disproportionately affect vulnerable communities. We're not going to, we're not going to hurt them. Fracking sites obviously affect people of color in those poor communities, because who are the people living in actual, like, who, who are the people living near fracking sites? Who are people living near factories? People who cannot afford to go anywhere else because they have nowhere else to go. And if we're actually contaminating their drink water and we're contaminating their places to live, where are they gonna go? They're not gonna go nowhere. Because of this, I urge you to vote for the affirmative plan. It's obviously a huge in, in, investment to our society and our environment in the future. Thank you. The negative speaker now has two minutes of flex time to ask questions of the affirmative team, starting now. Question. So, um, do you have any data to support that fracking has contaminated water? That fracking has contaminated water? Yes. Um, yes. So, according to the EPA and the United States Geological Service survey, it's recently confirmed that the, um, communities across the United States are blaming hydrofracking for contaminating their groundwater. So they blame it, but there's their actual evidence that that was the main cause due to fracking. Well, if, if the EPA reported it, they obviously did a significant investigation, and that means that it directly affected. It was directly affected because of hydrofracking. Okay, and if we ban fracking, um, what happens to those who work in the fracking industry? What happens? Well, we don't know the long-term effects of people actually working in the fracking industry. Most of them are companies, and they're the ones running the operations from behind desks, in offices, in big tall buildings. Okay, and then do you deny that your plan would increase the cost of energy? S specify your type of energy. So if we were to get rid of this fracking, do you think that it would increase the cost of energy, such as uh, gas or water? If we ban fracking, there might be a rise or a, maybe a high rise in the price of energy, yes. Okay. And then, how did we access these fossil fuels before the invention of fracking? How did we what, I'm sorry? How did we access fossil fuels before the discovery of fracking? Well, we did extract um, oil from the ground, we just did it without hydrofracking. We didn't, because hydrofracking, mind you, is like directive drilling. So it's not, it's not, it's going directly down and it's not, but with hydrofracking, it's going at an angle. So because it's going at angle, it's angles, it's kind of Thank you. Mess, messing up. So. Thank you. I now recognize the negative speaker to deliver a constructive speech not to exceed seven minutes. All right, so I'm going to go back to what my opponent here has said. You said seven minutes, better. Um, to what my opponent here has said, then I'm going to, or I apologize, go into what I have to say, go into what my opponent has said, and then answering to what my opponent here has said. So let's begin. So the disadvantage here is that um, we're going to be dealing with coal if we get rid of this, uh, this fracking. So according to the website of the Environmental Protection Agency, fracking is a main method used to extract oil and natural gas from the ground. In recent years, fracking has led to the U.S. to be an energy exporter, and as of 2018, the U.S. has produced so much natural gas that the U.S. Energy Administration reported that the U.S. has become a net exporter, meaning that we are in the position to sell natural gas to other countries. We argue the transition to natural gas, a clean burning fuel, is good. 
And there is, um, this has been the main reason that the U.S. has been shifting away from dirty coal to powered energy. As reported by the Brookings Institute this past January, there is no bringing back coal. And in the last 10 years alone, coal has actually declined by 40% because of fracking. We argue that this is a good thing, and the Brookings evidence goes on to explain that the single largest reason for the decline of coal is the ready availability of cheap natural gas. The link here is this, uh, which is why it's implementing the affirmatives. This plan would be so harmful if we were to get rid of this fracking. Um, if you were to allow the plan to pass, it would end all fracking in the United States, not just some, all. This would be devastating to the U U.S. gas industry. And a 2009 art uh, article from the Investopedia explains that the prior to the invention of hydraulic fracking, the cost to extract gas made it economically impossible when compared to far cheaper alternatives like coal. My opponent here wasn't sure. Uh, so I'm giving you, the, you guys the answers here. After the plan, this would once again be the case, prompting a return to the far more destructive coal-fired plants. This means that the U.S. must turn to other, mes other methods to produce energy. We are most likely to use coal, taking a throwback over here, because the U.S. has largest coal reserves in the world. The Energy Policy Institute uh, points out that if we ran fracking, coal will be making a roaring comeback. You cannot uh, integrate renewables without natural gas serving as a backup. However, coal is an even dirtier form of energy compared to fracking, which emits 45% less carbon dioxide per energy unit than coal production. And for the U.S., fracking provides an opportunity to achieve energy self-sufficiency and reduce carbon emissions. But if we ban fracking, we will see severe impacts. And then some of these impacts include air pollution, water pollution, global warming, and kind of cutting into these details for air pollution, you get all these airborne toxins and pollutants that include heavy metals such as mercury, lead, uh, sulfur, and other particulates and heavy metals. And these health problems can cause asthma, cancer, neurological disorders, even death. And we cannot allow to ban fracking because of this. And the water pollution here, you would get a ton of different kinds of elements coming into your body that you should not have. They're highly toxic, such as arsenic, barium, beryllium, and boron. And then for global warming, climate change is coal's most serious long-term global impact. And chemically, coal is mostly carbon, which when burned, it reacts to the oxygen in the air to produce the CO2, and which is a heat-trapping gas that acts as a blanket into the atmosphere. And then the energy markets here, economically, so many people will be losing jobs, specifically, in 2005, between 2005 and 2012, fracking created 725,000 jobs, and the economy had actually grown, and emissions had declined just by fracking alone. However, if this plan passes, it will um, it eliminates cost-effective energy produ production by banning this fracking, and these investors will literally run away if there is no option of fracking because it's such a huge contribution to the U.S. economy. And the more impacts that happen here if we were to ban this fracking is that there will be severe job loss. And so as mentioned earlier, fracking has created a substantial number of jobs that would disappear if they were banned. A 2016 report from the Global Energy Institute points out that if fracking were banned, by 2022, 14.8 million jobs could be lost. Gasoline prices and electricity prices could almost double. And uh, each American family could see their cost of living increase by $4,000. That is $4,000 that could be well spent and put into your pockets. You guys right now are at NJC. How far can $4,000 take you? Pretty far. And this is especially troubling because it would drive families into poverty. A 2019 CBS report claims that 40% of Americans cannot afford an unexpected $400 cost. That is just minimal compared to what is going to happen if we keep uh, banning this hydraulic fracking. And, and increased energy prices further chips away at household budgets and will push many into poverty. So again, kind of go back, going back into this too, it's a transgenerational effect because it's not just going to affect us, it's going to affect our children, our grandchildren, so on and so forth, and our, our generations that have yet to come. And so going back to this too, uh, a lot of the detriments that are coming here as far as not being able to afford a simple $400 bill for medical, um, for any medical procedures that have to come, keep in mind that if we get rid of fracking, these $400 will be billions of dollars or have this equivalent of millions of dollars. It'll be so much money um, because all these, these, uh, these jobs will be lost. 
and the energy markets will be gone, and then the fracking, um, the fracking jobs will be gone. And so again, we want to make sure we can maintain these fracking jobs so that way we can keep the price of energy lower, such as the gas and the electricity and other bills that we have to pay. And again, keep in mind that with these $4,000 that we could be saving, we could obviously be using it into our education for our children, for our schools, for our community, for our own gas money, for our own books. And so I also want to go back and answer to my, uh, my opponent here for what she had said for some of these things. She says it keeps, um, keeps us dependent on fossil fuels. True, however, we do have many other ways that we can uh, accommodate to this as well. We have plenty of energy way ways that we can support this energy. We obviously have water, we have air, we have all these non-renewable resources, but fracking is something that is so important that we need to keep because if we don't, then we're gonna continue to see all these detriments of um, coal coming into the into play because with coal, it's gonna leak into our water system. It's so much worse than what fracking is bringing. It's bringing literal, poten the potential of the, the potentiality of bringing death if we were to bring this back. We're gonna go back to like the industrial revolution here and that's something we do not need. And then um, according to my uh, opponent as well, that she had said that the poor is going to suffer because they're within a one mile radius. Yes, of course, they're gonna be within a one mile radius. They're gonna be within a hundred mile radius. We're all here, we're all enclosed. We're all nearby to where all these hydraulic fracking systems go. But all these companies pay for the reprimands that go on. We can pay for these water filtration systems. There are plenty of communities that bring together these sources so that way they can thrive in their local communities and bring these filtration systems and other ways of bringing in more jobs to these impoverished people to improve their quality of life. And then um, the poor communities will always have somewhere to go because they will always have these uh, programs recommended. Please vote for Ned. The affirmative speaker now has two minutes of flex time to ask questions of the negative team, starting now. Thank you. Um, I have a few questions for you, Alex. If you don't mind. Close. Can you not hear me? No, no. <laughs> okay, so based on what you've presented with us today, you're telling me that the direct substitute for hydraulic fracturing is coal? Yes. Why? Because coal, no, if hydraulic fracturing were to be eliminated, coal would be the substitution because that is the next best thing that we have in terms of what's the best substitute for hydraulic fracking. But you did mention in your speech that we're looking for other energy sources, correct? Of course. Right. So do you think that obviously markets are more likely to shift towards a more reliable source of energy? They can, however, um, coal, what, well, in the substitution of coal, which hopefully doesn't happen, you guys vote nay, um, the coal will be in place of all the, of fracking. And so if we were to also, because there are some things that water, wind, and solar can't do for what coal, if we were to use it, and hydraulic fracking can bring. So if we were to eliminate this completely, there are a lot of things that we won't be able to fulfill um, in the terms of substituting it or replacing it for those renewable resources. Or, yeah, renewable resources. All right, thank you. Are you also aware, or are you also confident in the fact that energy markets are super reliant on fracking? They are? Could you repeat the question? Sorry. Are you super um, confident in the fact that energy markets are reliant on fracking to produce business? I believe so, absolutely. There are definitely alternatives to that. And then with fracking, it also adds on another thing that we could tie into economically, because if we were to add those, if we were to add these energy markets and put those into play, then we would have more uh, finan finances to work with in terms of strengthening the economy. All right, thank you. I now recognize the affirmative speaker to deliver a speech not to exceed five minutes. All right, so for those of you that, not many of you, but for those of you who are flowing, I am gonna give a brief roadmap and I am going to kind of touch on some points she made on her case. And then I am going to hopefully 
sway you the other side towards my plan and taste. So with that, I am going to start my time now. All right, so the negative is talking about how the United States is a major US net exporter for oil and other energies, ener energy thing, um, production, energy production, pr production, basically because we've amped up fracking in the past. And I'm not denying that fact, it's true. The United States does produce three billion barrels of oil a year. A level of production, mind you, has, that hasn't been seen since the 70s. This dramatic turnaround is also, however, directly attributed to fracking. We have a current surplus of excess oil. We have more than enough in the United States. We are not buying it from anywhere else. This, obviously, this thing has made us dependent on ourselves enough to not need anybody else to supply us with energy. We don't need it. So that means with this excess, we can focus on other things. We have the value, obviously, of oil has reduced, and it's not reliant, in, uh, we're not reliant on anyone else to give it to us. We've passed that. And mind you, there is no regulatory framework for how fracking will keep toxins out of the air and how wa water will be, will be less contaminated or how it will protect us from climate and carbon and other detrimental effects this is actually producing. Okay, with that, while low natural gas prices have helped not pull off the market, yes, it's true, this has helped not pull off of the market exponentially, low oil prices because of fracking have encouraged more travel. In fact, transportation is now the largest source of greenhouse gas in the United States. Mind you, the backup for renewables being natural gas is extremely misrepresented because the Washington Post in 2019, just last month, declared that those renewables won't even see the light of day with the United States' growing need for cars and air travel. Those low oil prices have undermined the business case for cleaner transportation alternatives, like electric cars and fuel cell-powered buses. We have no efficiency in how our public transportation could actually excel for the future because there's no other alternative. Those low oil prices um, also, devastating the U.S.'s natural gas industry might not be such a bad thing. I'm going to tell you it right here. Natural gas itself is the climate problem. That's what we're trying to prevent. Methane, the thing I said is horrible, is the dominant component of natural gas. And yes, it does produce less carbon dioxide than coal when burned. But if methane leaks, which, be, which it often does in some quantity during normal gas extraction operations, it becomes a potent greenhouse gas. And over the over a hundred year time frame, a quantity of methane traps more than 25 times more amount of heat compared to any amount of carbon dioxide that coal could contribute. Which means that this is detrimental. The risk is too great. We cannot allow this to happen because of this obviously hurtful thing to us. Their whole, the whole energy market case for fracking is also starting to weaken because more energy drilling companies are actually declaring bankruptcy. It's true, they are. They have nowhere else to go because, I mean, it's true that natural gas is more cost effective, but the Rocky Mountain Institute just estimated that clean energy is now increasing, increasingly more competitive than natural gas power plants. And by 2035, it would be cheaper to build new wind, solar, and other storage renewable energy products. My opponent said so herself. She said that these companies could shift to other things. We don't have to ship back to coal. Those jobs that are super reliant on those fracking companies will literally see the back door. And we're going to see a boom much like the negative brought up, but now with renewables instead. So it's probably actually a good thing. Plus, those energy companies that the negative is trying to protect have a weak to non-existent policies that actually protect the environment. They don't help us. They don't help anybody. They don't care. They obviously don't. These companies are negligent with our communities and have absolutely no regard to how any of their practices might actually affect people as a whole because those companies are obviously putting their sights in a various amount of disenfranchised communities. Obviously, there's a correlation. I don't see any kind of bad air quality or water pollution or contaminated groundwater near any kind of company or very nice industrial, like, like utopia kind of area or city. We don't see that because they're rich. All they care about is money. And if they don't see it in the natural gas industry, they'll go somewhere else. Natural gas in the United States is leaking. It is leaking. 
And if we continue and keep this, um, allow this to keep happening, it's just gonna hurt people even more. Climate change is in instrumental to how we're reacting to this problem. So I urge you to vote affirmative for this plan. I recognize the negative speaker to deliver a rebuttal speech not to exceed six minutes. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and answer and acknowledge what my opponent has been saying, and I'll go on to uh, strengthen my negative case as well, and as well as discuss the affirmative case that my opponent was discussing. So let's begin. All right, so my opponent here is saying that the U.S. net exporter for oil has, uh, we are the, the net exporter for oil as being in the United States. That's awesome. We should be able to be the net exporter for that because we are able to contribute more money into the economy. If we were to stop fracking, we wouldn't be contributing more money, money into this economy. And so according to my um, opponent here, she had said that this is old news, that this has not been a thing since the 80s. We have been surplus for a really long time, for many years since the 80s, but my source here is clearly from 2018. So that is a year old, so that is very much new. Um, and of course, uh, our, my opponent had also said that it made the U.S. dependent to not need anyone else. We never discussed anything about having to rely on overseas. We were discussing things about fracking here in the United States. Um, I just wanted to address that too, that we're talking about here, we're fine, we're dependent. Again, we have a surplus, we don't need anybody else right now. And gas prices um, have, of course, helped knock coal out of the market. That's the entire point here, that we don't want to have coal here. We want to acknowledge that coal is terrible, it is bad, and by fracking, you're gonna get rid of this uh, these oil, the, this uh, natural gas that we're getting here, and it's gonna cause such a detriment. And we're gonna go back to the Industrial Revolution on trains and dealing with disease and water, uh, water compromisation with uh, certain diseases that come through, like heavy metals and everything. And then, um, of course, the, some of these methane gases that I want to acknowledge that my opponent had said as well. She said that methane is leaking because, and it's a post, potent greenhouse gas, greenhouse gas. And I just wanted to address as well that we are not the worst nation that is emitting these greenhouse gases. We have two other countries above us that are not doing anything to solve this. So of course, these greenhouse gases are happening here, but it's happening in much worse and much more severe ways than they are happening here in the United States. Um, and so here is just a minimal problem and we're not, we're not contributing that much into the issue here. We have to worry about these two other countries and hold them responsible for this. Because we don't need to eliminate our fracking for what they're doing. We don't need to claim responsibility for them. They're adults, they know what they're doing. And here, the energy market, uh, my opponent said that the energy market is weak because coal, the coal industry is bankruptcy. Good, it should be under bankruptcy because we don't need this. We need hydraulic fracking to happen. We don't need, we can't have coal here. It shouldn't be happening here. We're not a third world country. We're not here living off of uh, no technology. We know what we're doing we, and we're doing it well. And so, um, completing with uh, the power plants here, of course, there, we're also going to be competing. As I had said earlier, I had acknowledged that, of course, we have all these resources here. We have air, we have wind, we have solar, and they can do a lot that hydraulic fracking cannot accomplish, as well as the uh, hydraulic fracking can accomplish a lot of what those things can do. So if we work together and we bring those things together, of course, we can all do so much more with hydraulic fracking, and we can even create more of a surplus. And so the gas is leaking and allowing, um, my opponent said that gas here is leaking, and the leakage is allowing a Happen. So of course we're going to make improvements on this based on the new the new locations that we uh, have made these fracking sites on, and so we're going to improve those things. And impoverished communities again, we are creating better jobs for people because we are bringing those into the communities. We have new hires, so they can no longer be considered impoverished, and it's also helping the economic stability of the United States. And there are again, I just want to say that there are things that gas can accomplish that renewable resources cannot, and vice versa. And so here. As I was saying as well, if we were to get rid of this fracking, 725,000 jobs will be severely lost and it will lead into job, again, job loss. And then um, it will cause people to not even, to be able to afford a simple, you know, oil change or anything such as that. So 
again, remember these impacts. Remember that if we were to ban this fracking, you wouldn't be able to afford uh, maybe even school. Loans will take will wipe you out because you won't be able to afford the simple bills that you know that come in come through your mail. And so the four thousand dollars that you'd be getting hyped on through your through other resources such as gas and water and electricity, then you won't you know, you kind of be bummed because you won't be able to afford any of that and you'll be in a higher debt and then your credit will go down and then you get all these all these detriments that will happen to you and you clearly don't want that to happen. So we need to keep the jobs here, keep the oil here, um, like circulating here in the United States, keep us out of surplus, keep the fracking going so we don't get coal and things leaked into our water, leaked into our air, and then global warming will lessen because if we were to, you know, come with this coal, it would just be so terrible and it would cause all this global warming. And I know methane gas is a contributor, but coal, but coal could be even worse in the long run. Because even though methane gas is happening through the hydraulic, uh, through the hydraulic fracking, um, it can happen way less due to the surplus. And if we were, as opposed to if we were to use coal all the time, it would build up and build up, which would eventually actually beat the methane leak that goes on into the atmosphere. So of course, again, I want to let uh, the audience know, please vote for negative because we are here to better the community, keep jobs here, keep the environment safe, reduce air pollution, reduce water contaminants, and then, um, we also want to make sure that we, we stay strong as a nation and we need to hold other nations responsible for, for things that we do not do that cause these severe impacts that already happen. Again, we need to hold other people responsible. We can't be responsible for the irresponsibility of others. And so I want you guys to take that into account, please, and vote for negative. Thank you. I now recognize the affirmative speaker to deliver a rebuttal speech not to exceed three minutes. Hello again, one last time. For those of you who are leaving, I'm sorry. Not a lot of better things to do, I assume, <laughs> than listen to me talk about my plan that's gonna lead us into the future, right? No. <laughs> So for those of you that are flowing, this is just a kind of summarization speech. I'm just going to go over some key factors that were made in this debate and kind of why you should join the dark, or in this case, the light side. <laughs> okay, with that, I'm going to begin my time now. Okay, so the negative is honing in on the fact that if we ban fracturing, then the automatic substitute will be coal. Really? Coal? But mind you, turning back to coal is kind of a stretch. I mean, you really believe what that, with the efforts so many energy companies are making with renewables, that they're going to go back to a system that was just highly inefficient in the first place? They're not gonna do that. They're not gonna do that. Companies aren't stupid. They're not going to invest in something that's not cost effective. And if the negative was really worried about business confidence and where energy markets would go after the spin, then we could obviously see in earlier parts of this debate, renewables, they're gonna go to some place that actually has a future, some place that's gonna bring us to a better tomorrow because this is the time to act. Fracking is hurting our environment. Fracking is polluting our water. Fracking is hurting those poor people, poor communities. Frack where's fracking local? Where are we fracking? We're not fracking in businesses. We're not fracking near businesses. We're not fracking in cities. We're fracking in very poor, disenfranchised communities. Literally 17 million Americans live near fracking sites. That's way too many, way too many. And this is, without, this is just the reported ones. What about the unreported ones? What about the ones that don't get a voice? What about the communities that are not acknowledged in our society? Because mind you, and this wasn't mentioned, but mind you, there are communities that are severely disenfranchised by the United States government. I think we all know who we're talking about. We know who we're talking about. Anyway. Um, because of this, fracturing is harming them. Fracturing is harming all of us. We can't drink water anymore. We can't go outside anymore. We can't play. Like, what's happening to us? What is happening? Fracturing is, fra this ban, this plan is gonna help us. This ban is gonna lead us into a future where we can use renewables for the better, where we don't have to compact our air quality anymore, where we don't have to see 
even a risk or a, a risk of that methane leaking. Why do we need to risk that? Because if that methane leaks, like I mentioned, if that methane leaks, then we are just looking at an obvious climate catastrophe, way more than we could see currently. And this is just gonna prolong effects that we obviously don't have clear cut solutions for. Who is the negative trying to protect? The negative is trying to protect the big businesses with deep pockets. They are not protecting our people. They're not protecting those, they're not protecting everybody else. They're just looking for a bigger payday. They're not looking for anything else. If they look at investments and quotas, they're gonna obviously see that in the long run, reverting to, reverting to coal is not gonna help them. It's actually renewables, new innovation, technology that's gonna help us go into a future that's gonna let us make the world better. So with that, I urge you to vote affirmative. Thank you all for coming out and have a good night.